Okay, so this talk is called Primordial Black Holes. And if we're going to talk about black holes, I suppose we ought to do a little bit to just recap on what a black hole is for anyone who's joining and has missed that bit. The simple explanation is that it relates to the idea of escape velocity. If you were to build a giant cannon, as someone has done here, and fire it out into space, if you fired it uh, fast enough, then the cannonball would never come back. If you fire it slowly, it'll go a little way and land in the ocean, fire it further, it'll travel maybe even over the horizon and then land. If you fired it at 17,500 miles an hour, it will go right round the earth in orbit and hit you in the back of the head. Um, and if you go at 25,000 miles an hour, then you've given it enough energy to climb all the way out of the gravity well caused by the earth. And so it'll never come back. And that's very well understood and easy mathematics from uh, uh, good old Isaac Newton to uh, let us work all of that out. It's not difficult at all. But we also have to bear in mind the speed of light and Here's Galileo with his first attempt in 1638 to try and measure the speed of light. He sent his poor long suffering assistant to a distant hilltop with a lamp and was with instructions to uncover it when he saw the uh, light from Galileo's lamp. And then when Galileo saw the assistant's lamp, he would uncover his own and so forth. It would flip flop backwards and forwards. And the idea was that from the round trip delay, you'd be able to work out how fast the uh, speed of sound is. Of course, it didn't work because the speed of uh, light is so much faster than um, the human reaction time. And uh, there would be no way that you could do this. I said the speed of sound just now because I'm getting ahead of myself. The uh, idea would work for the speed of sound. If you made a loud noise, you would just about be able to do this experiment because it's uh, slow enough that you would be able to react in time. But Galileo concluded that the speed of light was at least 10 times faster than that of speed of sound. So it wasn't a completely null result. But it led to an experiment or a set of observations by Ole Roma um, in 1676, where he did the same experiment, but he enlisted the help of Jupiter as his glamorous assistant on the far hilltop. And the moon Io going around it, going into eclipse, took the place of the lamp being covered and uncovered. And by measuring the time delay between the appearance and disappearance of Io, at different points on the Earth's orbit, he was able to use that round trip delay to calculate the speed of light. Essentially, at some time, he was able to have the Earth here at G, uh, measure the CG time would determine when Io disappeared, but at other times at point F, you would have the extra distance. And so the uh, disappearance of Io would appear to be late. And from that uh, delay, he could calculate the speed that light had uh, crossed the gap from G to F. And he got a quite a close answer, 22, um, two th uh, sorry, 220,000 kilometers per second compared to nearly 300,000, which is the modern number that we all use. So the speed of light is not infinite. And that led to the realization that uh, there was a possibility of a very massive object having an escape velocity greater than the speed of light. This was first pointed out by the clergyman astronomer John Mitchell, and he calculated that a star 500 times the size of the sun, so with the same overall density but just 500 times larger, would have an escape velocity of the speed of light and reasoned that such a monster would be invisible. And he came out with the uh, name for this as the dark star hypothesis. 
And it fitted with the, some of the observations because it seemed that we weren't seeing stars that were of arbitrarily large mass. Um, the largest seemed to be one, two, three hundred times the mass of the sun, and anything bigger than that just didn't seem to exist. And so he reasoned that maybe the reason we weren't seeing such things was because they were invisible rather than because they weren't out there, this dark star idea. I'm just going to throw this in as well because it's uh, important to uh, understanding of the speed of light. This is the Michelson-Morley experiment at the turn of the uh, century, the 1890s. And the idea was to try and measure the speed of, the li of light very accurately in the lab in two directions at the same time at right angles to each other. So the idea is you have a light source, you send the beam into the center of the apparatus where there's a part silvered mirror and the light path is split. Part of it goes onto the flat mirror here and then back to the detector. The other part takes a different route and it re recombined back at the detector. So it makes an interferometer. You can very, very accurately measure any change in the time of flight of the light beams in the two directions because they will arrive either in phase or out of phase with each other. And the whole apparatus is mounted on this rotating turntable on a very smooth mercury bath. So they could orient it around in different directions and see if rotating the table made any difference to the result. Now, the idea actually was to try to work out if they could find a direction where one of the beams was in the direction of motion of the Earth through the luminiferous ether that was uh, supposedly the medium in which light moved. Uh, and if the Earth was moving through it, it would be have a preferred direction and we would be able to measure the speed of light being different in that direction moving with the movement of the Earth as opposed to at right angles to it. But rather contrary to common sense, they found nothing whatsoever by way of change, no matter what they did. And this uh, proved that the speed of light was independent of the direction of motion or the velocity of motion of the source. So if it was pointing in the direction of the Earth's motion around the sun or the whole of the solar system through the galaxy, these are really quite high speeds, but it made no difference compared to the motion at right angles to that, quite contrary to Galilean ideas of relativity. And of course, this was one of the foundation points for Einstein. And Einstein pr produced his theory of special relativity all about uh, what happens with constant motion in 1905 and then 10 years later followed it up with general relativity which deals with gravity and acceleration. And it was in the same year that he published his uh, groundbreaking paper on his theory of gravity, general relativity, that uh, this chap, Carl Schwarzschild, was able to use Einstein's equations to prove that a sufficiently massive, dense object could be such that no light would be able to escape from it and produce the formula that you see at the bottom there, which is one of the easiest formulas around. And it's just that the radius R is equal to 2g over c squared, those are constants, g is the strength of gravity straight out of Newton's formula, and c is this constant speed of light, and m is the mass of the object. So if you ignore the c squared and the g, because those are really just to get our units correct, then it's telling us that the radius of the object is just proportional to its mass. More mass, bigger, less mass, smaller. And it would define a boundary in space and time between the inner and outer worlds, either side of what's called the event horizon, because no event that occurs inside the black hole can have any influence on any event outside. No information, no uh, nothing can escape. 
So this is the Schwarzschild radius, and it marks this uh, position of the event horizon. And as I say, nothing can get out. You cannot see what's going on inside. And if you crossed inside, you would be able to discover what was happening in there, but you'd never be able to come out and tell anybody about it. And just to give you some ideas on, on that, if we uh, take an object of the mass of the sun and we calculate the Schwarzschild radius for it, it's three kilometers. So you would have to squeeze the whole of the mass of the sun down into a region three kilometers in radius uh, in order for it to form a black hole and have an event horizon around it. Likewise, you could do the same with the Earth, but you would have to squeeze it from its current uh, radius down to uh, just one and a half centimetres across. Uh, very tiny indeed, something slightly larger than a ball bearing or a marble uh, with the mass of the Earth would be a black hole. And there's nothing particularly magic about the size. They could come in all sizes. It's just simply that uh, the mass determines the radius using that formula. Indeed, the ones that we know about that exist that have been observed or their effects have been observed are either those that form from the collapse of giant stars, so-called stellar black holes. They have stars as their origin. And these type two core collapse supernovae of uh, large stars greater than 10 and a half solar masses <sighs> will collapse down and form a residual core of five, maybe 10 solar masses of black hole. On the other hand, we have intermediate, uh, the, the supermassive black holes, which live at the center of galaxies. And these are much, much more massive. The one that we have in the center of uh, our galaxy, Sagittarius A star, is four million solar masses, uh, but that's a tiddler. The one that they imaged in this picture here in uh, M87 is a thousand times more massive again. So four billion solar masses compressed into a region that uh, uh, is dense enough to form a black hole. And we think every galaxy has one of these supermassive black holes. And indeed, there seems to be a relationship between the mass of the galaxy and the mass of the central black hole, such that a tenth of a percent of the total mass of the galaxy tends to be the mass of the black hole in the center. And we don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg. We don't know if the black hole controls the formation of the galaxy, or if the galaxy controls the amount of mass that falls into the black hole, or perhaps the two are related in some more complicated way. It's a, an area of interesting research. We do also have these other quirky objects called globular clusters. And these orbit around the outside of galaxies like the Milky Way. We have about 400 of them buzzing around the outside of the Milky Way, rather like bees around a honeypot. And they contain maybe half a million stars each. And some of them, if not all of them, seem to contain an intermediate mass black hole that is intermediate between the sort of stellar mass of 10 solar masses and these uh, supermassive ones in the centers of galaxies. And they also seem to obey that 0.1% uh, law so that they are fitting the same graph that you get with galaxies. So it's suggestive that these are some sort of mini galaxy. Perhaps they're the uh, cores of uh, small galaxies that have uh, then lost all of their outer regions that have been stolen by their parent galaxy like the Milky Way. So just to illustrate that point, we see a range of these sizes from the intermediate mass in globular clusters like M15 or G1 that's a bit bigger that orbits around Andromeda through to the ones in the spiral galaxies and the real monsters inside the giant elliptical galaxies. And they all lie on this nice 0.1% curve. So those are the black holes that we know about that are out there in the universe today. 
and that we've got reasonably strong evidence of their existence. Now I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit because we need to crack on and talk about um, the work of Stephen Hawking a little bit. And in particular, Stephen's masterpiece, which was that he realized in 1974 that black holes had a problem with the law of thermodynamics. And his uh, research into this led him to write a paper that really shocked the scientific world and made him famous. And it made him famous because it was the first paper to successfully combine the three great pillars of modern physics into one uh, mathematical entity, quantum mechanics, general relativity and thermodynamics. Putting all of these together without it blowing up in his face was a real achievement. And it came out with the theory that black holes ain't so black, which is actually the chapter of one of his books. Another chapter in his book, chapter four in uh, The Brief History of Time, deals with the reason why this comes to be. And it's to do with the quantum mechanics aspect and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And this really tells us in, in the very short version of, of this that we cannot know the amount of energy of a quantum system precisely. It tells us that the more precisely we try to measure the energy of a given quantum state, the shorter the lifetime of that state will be before it changes. And the, that means, of course, that the, uh, the information that we gain is soon out of date. And it really means there is a, a blurry uncertainty to the amount of energy that there is in any system. And that includes a completely empty system. A, co a completely empty space would have completely zero energy. And that would violate the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, because if there's zero energy, then there's zero uncertainty. Well, nature seems to have got this covered in that it responds by making empty space seethe with short-lived virtual particle pairs. It's as if it pops into existence, as in the diagram, a particle and its mirror antiparticle, so perhaps an electron and a positron, and that these borrow energy from space-time and briefly pop into existence and then they reannihilate with each other and pay back the energy that they borrowed uh, within the time limit set by Uncle Heisenberg and the uncertainty principle. And this enables uh, the empty space not to have zero energy on average, and it means that the uncertainty principle is satisfied. But it's a very, very curious thing. It's not something we find in our everyday experience. It only really happens on these tiny, tiny scales of individual pairs of particles. But what Stephen Hawking realized was that if you had uh, this process occurring throughout space, then it would sometimes occur near a black hole. And perhaps over here, a particle pair has popped into existence and then recombined and paid the energy back perfectly normal thing to happen in empty space. But down here, another pair have cr been created from nothing by borrowing some energy from space time. And then one of them has carelessly fallen into the nearby black hole and crossed the event horizon. And it's doomed at that point, it can't get back out. And so now its partner has nothing to annihilate with and is forced to become a real particle. Now this seems to violate all sorts of things. In particular, it seems to violate the idea of the conservation of energy because we've created a particle out of nothing. And we haven't said what became of the particle that fell in either. Well, they both become real particles because they can't annihilate with each other. And that means no one is paying back the cosmic accountant as regards the energy that they borrowed to get created in the first place. But the answer to the problem is that the blue particle that fell into the black hole 
is falling down a gravity well. And in the process, it is releasing a lot of gravitational potential energy. And that energy is used to pay back the debt to the universe, to space time, that uh, was borrowed in the first place and enables them to become real. So you can't see the particles that fall in, but you can see the particles that stream out and become real. They appear to emerge from the edge of the event horizon and stream outwards. And this is now called Hawking radiation, uh, named after the man himself. And he didn't just predict it, he was able to calculate exactly how much you would expect to see. And the result of anything that is giving off radiation is that it has a temperature. And Stephen's calculation was a very nice, simple formula that you can use to work out the temperature of a black hole. So I violated one of Stephen's rules here and had more than one equation in this talk already. Uh, I think we're, we're up to about three so far. And I don't think they're terribly frightening. This is the Hawking temperature is one over eight pi times the mass. So very simple, you plug in the mass, out comes the temperature. And it's an inverse relationship. The more massive the black hole, the lower the temperature. And that's quite a surprise. You would think more massive objects would be more violent, but it turns out that they're not, they're more quiescent because of this relationship. And the reason is that the large massive black holes, the event horizon is a long way from the center because of that large Schwarzschild radius. And so the slope of gravity and the tidal forces and so on associated with the slope are quite modest as you fall in across the event horizon. In fact, for a supermassive black hole, you would probably survive it intact. You'd be doomed eventually because you would fall in and uh, get too close to the singularity and be torn to shreds. But the passage across the event horizon would go without a murmur. Whereas for a very small black hole, gravity is very steep at the event horizon because it's very near the central point. And so for a small black hole, you don't have to move very far to fall a long way down the hill. That means you can gain a lot of energy without moving very far. And if you don't have to move very far, you can do it in a short time. And remember, this virtual particle uh, process is on a time limit set by the uncertainty principle. And so within the time limit, you can fall far enough down a steep slope to pay back a lot of energy. And that's why the steep slopes of small black holes at the event horizon have a very high Hawking temperature, whereas the much more gentle slopes, you really have a tough time falling far enough in the time limit to give out any worthwhile amount of energy. And so supermassive black holes have a very, very low uh, Hawking temperature. In fact, I've cheated a little bit because I've. this is the correct formula here. It's got a bunch of other constants in it that Stephen worked out. It's got H, which is Planck's constant, turns up in quantum mechanics everywhere. It's got the speed of light cubed on the top there, C cubed. It's got G, the strength of gravity. Well, it would have, wouldn't it? And it's also got KB, which is Boltzmann's constant, which is all about turning uh, energy into temperature. So you need that in there to get the units to work out. And we can work out uh, that this is 1.2 times 10 to the power 23 degrees Kelvin for every kilogram of mass. So uh, on the top divided by the mass of the object. So as the mass, if you had a one kilogram black hole, it would have a temperature of 1.2 times 10 to the 23 Kelvin, which is a stupendous temperature. Perhaps a more sensible one is to look at the mass of the sun going in there. If you have an object of one solar mass, then it has a temperature of, well, six times 10 to the minus eight degrees Kelvin. That's uh, in the micro Kelvin range, the uh, 
millionths fractions, even the billionths of a of a degree. So very, very cold temperature indeed for a, a black hole of the mass of the sun. And that might be a bit of a surprise. In fact, if we worked out the temperature that you would get by converting the moon into a black hole, uh, it would be about a tenth of a millimeter across. And that would have a temperature of 2.7 degrees Kelvin. And I picked that example for a very uh, special reason, which we'll come back to later on. So this radiation is carrying energy away. We've, we've had energy from space time being converted into these particles, one of which the black hole has swallowed, uh, but the other one it has escaped. And the energy to create that escaping Hawking radiation particle has come from the space time and the gravitational energy of the black hole. And so the black hole loses energy as it's giving off this Hawking radiation. Here's my other equation, E equals mc squared. If it's losing energy, it's losing mass. And so it's going to shrink and it's going to get smaller and smaller. And eventually it'll evaporate completely. How long will that take? Well, of course, we can plug that into the maths as well. And don't worry too much about it. I've worked it out for you here. Um, it's a bunch of constants, again, times the cube of the mass of the black hole. And so the more massive a black hole is, the longer its lifetime is going to be. That makes sense. It's got a, a lot more mass that it's got to lose in order for it to uh, evaporate. But it also means that very small black holes have a very short evaporation time. And of course, that makes sense because, as we know, they've got a very high temperature. And so we can manipulate this number a little bit and again work out that for something of the mass of the sun, it would take 2.1 times 10 to the power 67 years for it to evaporate. That's 10 to the 67 years is a huge number that's vastly greater than the uh, age of the universe. So really, even for stellar mass black holes, intermediate mass black holes, supermassive black holes, this is all a complete irrelevance. The Hawking evaporation time is so huge that it's uh, well beyond the range of anything that we could conceive of in the uh, current universe. So we just don't have to worry about these black holes evaporating. But smaller objects have shorter lifetimes, as we saw. What if we wanted to work out the mass of an object that was going to have a lifetime less than the age of the universe? The age of the universe is 13.7 billion years. So let's go for 10 billion. And we plug that into the numbers and it works out at a mass of 100 billion kilograms. This is how I did it. I said we need to go from 10 to the 67 to this age, which is 10 to the 10. A billion is 10 to the 9. One more lot of 10, 10 to the 10. So I've got to lose 57 powers of 10. It's a cube law. So I can divide my 57 by 3 and get 19. And I have to take 19 away from the 19 powers of 10 away from the mass of the sun. The mass of the sun is about 10 to the power 30 kilograms. 30 minus 19 is 11. So we need about 10 to the power 11 kilograms or 100 billion. But what is 100 billion kilograms? Well, Mount Everest is a thousand times more than that. It's 10 to the 14 kilograms. So if we were able to make a black hole that was not the size of Mount Everest, but a thousand times smaller, so I don't know, the Gog Magog Hills or something, we converted those into uh, a, a black hole, then it would have a lifetime 
roughly 10 billion years. As you can see there, because Mount Everest is a thousand times longer, and because of this cube law here, uh, we can work out that it will last 10 times longer. So uh, uh, if we took the whole of Mount Everest, it would have a lifetime of 100 billion years. So just uh, uh, under 10 times the age of the universe. So we can easily do these calculations. So as I said, the, the temperature for this, a stellar mass black hole would be uh, 0.1 of a micro Kelvin, a tenth of a millionth of a degree. But in the real world, the, the temperature of space, because of the cosmic microwave background radiation, is 2.725 degrees Kelvin. So anything that is colder than the cosmic microwave background is actually going to receive more energy in from the microwaves than it's giving out. So any, even for a stellar mass black hole in the current universe, it will be slowly growing and feeding on the cosmic microwaves. And it's, that's going to massively be faster than the uh, rate at which it is trying to evaporate with this temperature. It's uh, 10 million times uh, faster. So again, in the real universe, the, uh, any of these uh, astrophysical black holes from stellar mass upwards are going to feed rather than evaporate. But this brings us to the special case that I mentioned before of turning the moon into a black hole, be about 10 micrometers across and would have a temperature of 2.7 degrees Kelvin, the same temperature as the cosmic microwave background. So it would neither grow nor shrink, it would stay about the same. Now, of course, the sharp people among you will have spotted that as the universe expands, that temperature of the cosmic microwave radiation is constantly going down to lower and lower energies. And so this boundary of one moon mass is a moving target. And uh, eventually the temperature of the universe will be cold enough for even a stellar mass black hole to evaporate in the extreme distant future. We said that a Mount Everest mass black hole would evaporate in 100 billion years, but a slightly smaller one that we said had a mass of 10 billion kilograms would be evaporating around about now. But of course, when I say around about now, we've got to remember that when we look out into the distant universe, we're looking back in time to events at earlier epochs. And so if we saw a black hole that had lived for 10 billion years, but was 3 billion years ago, uh, 3 billion light years distance, then it would have had its origin just after the Big Bang at 13 billion years ago. And so you can trade distance for time in terms of looking for the uh, evaporation of primordial black holes of different masses that might have been formed way back in the early universe. And uh, that means we can search for any that are in the range of a million tons to a billion tons or more. And that we would be seeing those going through their final act of evaporation anytime uh, out there in the universe about now, depending on how far away we look. And so the idea then is do we see any, what, what do we call primordial black holes, the title of this talk? These black holes that might have been formed in the earliest time of the universe. Uh, is that a possibility? And would we be able to see them reaching the end of their lives as they evaporated if they were of those sorts of modest masses? Well, it's a very, very interesting question because to form a black hole, you need to pack enough material together to get it within that Schwarzschild radius. And so you'd think perhaps at first sight that the hot, dense state of the Big Bang had all the right conditions for having that high density. And so you'd think that things would naturally tend to collapse into 
black holes. And in fact, you might be quite surprised to th that uh, not more of the material had been eaten up in that way right at the beginning. But to form a black hole, you don't need high density. You need a local excess density. If you're a high density region surrounded by low density regions, that's fine. But if you're surrounded by other high density regions, then the gravity of those regions pulling out will be about the same as your gravity pulling in and down. And so you won't be able to collapse. So you need this idea of a local excess density. And so actually it's not the case that the Big Bang just being dense is enough for it to collapse to form myriad small black holes. It would need local fluctuations to be quite extreme enough to trigger the formation of uh, these, these primordial black holes. And that's much more of a, uh, a difficult and problematic process. But it still could have happened. We still we see, of course, the undulations and the variations in the cosmic microwave background. And that gives us a clue to how smooth or uneven the early universe would be and whether or not these uh, primordial black holes would have stood a chance of forming. Now, Stephen Hawking pointed out that quantum mechanics tells us that the smallest possible black hole is one of the Planck mass from quantum mechanics, which works out to be quite a sizable 22 micrograms. That's uh, quite big for anything in quantum mechanics. It would be extraordinarily tiny, 10 to the minus 35 meters. It's a very, very tiny size. But it would also have an immense Hawking temperature that, that should in fact say 10 to the power 36 degrees Kelvin. There's a minus sign crept in there that is wrong. And so it would also evaporate through that uh, Hawking radiation and be gone after five times 10 to the minus 39 of a second. Once, of course, the uh, surrounding universe had cooled below that 10 to the 36 Kelvin. So tiny quantum black holes like this would have all evaporated in the very first instance of the cooling of the Big Bang and be gone from our record now. Okay, so we would not be able to see them. For a black hole to have survived from the Big Bang until around about now and be observable to us, it has to have lived that sort of 10 billion years uh, age. And for uh, such a black hole, it would probably have had to have begun with that mass of 10 to the 11 kilograms. Otherwise it would have been uh, and evaporated by now. So these are the ones that we're interested in. Mm -hmm. The question really is, do we find them out there? Sorry. Now, the thing with black hole evaporation is that it's a runaway process. As they shrink, as we've seen, smaller black holes have higher temperature, so they shrink um, yeah, more rapidly. And this, just some background on. noise. Can someone put themselves on mute? Also, this is great thing about you've got to say it's like they sort of imply you need a solicitor to sign that you're legitimate trustees, but I'm not going to done it for you. So I was saying that it's, an, it's a runaway process. As they shrink, the temperature rises. So they shrink faster. So it rises some more at smaller scales. And what we would see is during the last fraction of a second, they would have the power output of tens of thousands of stars and look like a supernova. And so the search is on looking for uh, objects going bang out there in the dark in the distant universe that might be in galaxies or they might be outside of galaxies. Who says that they have to be anything to do with a galaxy? They could be anywhere in space and just going bang, looking somewhat like a supernova, but the spectrum would be different. This would have the perfect unmodified spectrum of Hawking radiation 
with no uh, absorption lines in it that uh, we get from stars because of their elemental composition. These black holes are not made of elements and so they don't have those absorption lines in their spectrum. So we would be able to tell the difference. And so the chase is on to go and try and detect these uh, monsters from the uh, echoes of the Big Bang and see whether we can find anything at all. Well, what have we found? Well, we found some interesting objects. The uh, Ogle Micro Lensing Survey has found very recently six candidate events for wandering black holes. Now, they're objects that are in that range of half a Earth mass to 20 Earth masses. So they could be other things. They could be rogue planets wandering between the stars, but they could be these primordial black holes with a, a reasonably large mass that has meant that they've persisted from the Big Bang to now without evaporating. So in addition to looking for the, the flash, we can look to see their gravitational lensing event as they pass in front of other stars and cause this, this brightening curve like this. It's a second way of detecting them. And the third way of detecting them is if they happen to engage in a merger. And this is a, a simulation of a pair of black holes merging with each other, spiraling inwards and giving off gravity waves in the process. And so another strong way of searching for primordial black holes is now to look for the faint ripples that would have come from small black holes merging with each other or perhaps merging with other slightly larger ones. And, uh, you know, we've detected the first several events of merging black holes now. Uh, the first event was a few years ago detected by LIGO and uh, detected the change in the light path lengths of the beams of light sent down these two four kilometer arms and back. It's a bit like a giant version of the Michelson-Morley experiment that we talked about in the first place. Only this is looking for not a change in the speed of light due to the uh, movement of the earth, which is impossible, but it is looking for a change in the length of the size, the metric of space time itself, uh, which would cause the light travel time to change. And here's a, the data that was acquired for the first merger that was detected. We've got the simulation on the right here and the two observatories saw the characteristic uh, signal as the frequency and amplitude increases and then suddenly stops when the merger occurs. And there's the sound of the black hole merging. I'll shut up and let you listen to it. There it is. That characteristic chirp in the audio there is the uh, merger of two black holes. It's uh, an audio rendering of this graph. I'll let it play one more time. There it goes. So we're hoping that we might be able to detect some of these smaller black holes and uh, by their mergers or by their uh, transit events or by them evaporating and creating supernovae. One idea of course is that maybe these wandering primordial black holes could account for quite a lot of the uh, missing mass the so-called dark matter that we believe must be out there filling the uh, galaxies with perhaps between uh, naught and 90% of the mass of some galaxies. Our Milky Way and others seem to have around 90% dark matter. We've discovered some galaxies that have 0% dark matter and everything in between. And it could be that these uh, small black holes could be accounting for many of them. We're most likely to either see them as these strange looking supernovae or we'll be detecting them gravitationally or perhaps because they wander in front of another star and cause a microlensing event.
Now there's one possible candidate in our backyard, which is that we haven't been able to find the so-called planet nine that seems to be deflecting the path of a lot of the scattered disk of uh, outer trans-Neptunian objects out beyond the Kuiper belt. There are Sedna and a number of other wandering dwarf planets and uh, asteroids that are apparently all marshaled on one side of the solar system. And the theory was that perhaps there was a large heavyweight body, planet nine, out there that could be causing them to all shuffle to one side. Unfortunately, surveys with very sensitive infrared telescopes like the WISE telescope have failed to find anything visible. And so the conclusion now might be, maybe it's not visible, maybe what is out there orbiting the sun is a small black hole. And when we say small, around about five times the mass of the Earth would be the sort of mass we would be looking for to explain the behavior of these strange objects in the outer solar system. So that's really quite a small black hole indeed, and is likely therefore to be the product of that primordial black hole formation rather than uh, uh, any other process. It's too small to have come from the normal stellar collapse. We also see imprinted on the cosmic microwave background, these strange dark markings. When you zoom right in with high resolution onto the cosmic microwave background, these bright regions that we normally see as the tiny specks seem to be overlaid by a pattern of dark blobs. And as the slide says, are these the shadows of dark holes? Perhaps they are dark matter black holes from the uh, beginning of time, primordial black holes made by the collapse of dark matter during the very earliest times of the uh, solar, uh, the universe's formation. And now they're blotting out the light of the cosmic microwave background. So the shadows of dark holes. I don't know the answer, nobody does. It's a fascinating question. And we are really are digging into some of the obscure corners of astronomy at this point. Now I've just got two more slides um, and I'm gonna ponder these to you as food for thought. Um, here we have the Schwarzschild formula, which we looked at in the beginning, that the radius of a black hole is 2g over c squared m. So if you know the mass, you can work out the Schwarzschild radius. Okay, well, I happen to know that the mass of the universe is 8.8 .8 times 10 to the 52 kilograms. That's quite heavy, it's quite a lot of stuff, but it's only six protons per cubic meter because most of space is empty. So let's plug that into the formula. Well, we've got the values of G and C there and C squared conveniently laid out. So my uh, young astronomers could easily do the calculation, whip out the calculator and work out that the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole with the mass of the universe is 13.7 billion light years. You may have heard that number before. The universe is 13.7 billion years old and a, therefore a light beam would have been able to travel 13.7 billion light years in the age of the universe. And it is a great curiosity that the age of the universe and the size of the universe seems to be such that the radius of the uh, equals exactly what you need for the universe to be um, inside its own black hole Schwarzschild radius. This is actually saying that the universe is right near the critical density that should cause it to uh, slow down to a halt. Uh, but of course, we now have learned of the existence of dark energy perhaps, 
which might change all of that. And I'm not really saying that the universe is a black hole. In fact, it's more like a white hole as described by Einstein, effectively a time reversed black hole. And secondly, there's good reason to believe that there is more universe outside the observable range that we can see. And therefore, if that too has a simple, similar structure to the stuff we can see, uh, then this calculation is uh, completely irrelevant. It's uh, just a quirk of the mathematics. But nobody really knows if that is a significant thing or not. And uh, finally, the final slide, I'm going to do something a little bit mind bending at the other end of the scale. We can use that Schwarzschild formula and instead of plugging in the whole of the mass of the universe, let's plug in the mass of an electron instead. That's 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, a tiny mass. We plug that into the Schwarzschild formula and say, what would the uh, size of a black hole be if it had that mass? Well, it's very, very tiny indeed, 10 to the minus 57 meters, which is almost too small to be uh, believable. But we can't quite do it. That's you know, not so fast, unfortunately. The Schwarzschild formula is not the last word on this. Because the electron is charged and because it's spinning, we actually need to use a rather more complicated version of general relativity called the uh, Kerr-Newman metric. And if we do that, then we get the equivalent of the Schwarzschild radius at 1.9 times 10 to the minus 13 meters, which is astonishingly close to the Compton wavelength of an electron, the uh, corresponding wavelength of it. And this would tell us that the electron might be uh, a naked ring singularity. It's of a size that is such that it doesn't have a black hole and because a uh, event horizon around it, so it's a spinning uh, ring with a singularity in the center, and maybe that's what an electron really is. And so maybe everything is made of black holes. <laughs> and on that note, I'll shut up. <laughs>